Now let's discuss the famous round robin scheduling, which constitutes the core of scheduling algorithms in most modern operating systems. We've already talked about uh, round robin scheduling uh, in the previous chapters. In round robin scheduling, uh, each process is given some uh, time quantum of length, say, Q milliseconds. So if the process uh, cannot complete its CPU burst during uh, the time quantum, it's uh, preempted from the CPU and uh, another process is scheduled into the CPU uh, for its time quantum. So this way you give the CPU in turn to different processes without waiting for those processes to complete their full uh, execution or uh, go for I.O. operations. This is especially useful when we want interactivity in the system because everybody gets a decent share of the CPU rather than waiting for a long process uh, that goes into the CPU for some reason, either because it came into the system earlier or it has a higher priority or whatever. In, this, in the case of round-robin scheduling, everyone gets a share of the CPU in some given time. That's a nice thing. In uh, most modern operating systems, the length of this time quantum is something between 10 to 100 milliseconds. So that means uh, in a short time, you will get a chance to go into the CPU. Uh, if, for example, we have N processes in the system and uh, say a time quantum uh, of length Q, then since there are n processes and they if they all have the same time quantum length pay attention i'm assuming that they all have the same time quantum in that case everyone gets one over n share of the cpu time so it appears like as if we have n processes processors and cpus each one working uh, at a rate, not as the uh, original one, but one end of that uh, pro, uh, CPU. So it is like we have many slow uh, CPUs, but one CPU for each pro process. In reality, of course, we have a single CPU and also that CPU is working much faster, but you don't get to use that CPU all the time. That's why you get this feeling, but this is quite sufficient for most applications. So uh, in such an approach, since everyone gets to go into the CPU in a round of N processes, each process would be waiting N minus one times that time quantum, which is of length Q. Therefore, no process waits more than N minus one Q time units. This is how we guarantee uh, a limited waiting time for each process. When uh, the process reaches the end of its uh, time quantum, the timer generates an interrupt and the operating system now takes control because of the interrupt, because of the timer interrupt, and it does the context switch and then returns back to, uh, again the user mode and the next process can now uh, resume uh, execution. Uh, the performance of the round-robin scheduling uh, becomes equivalent to the performance of FIFO or FCFS if Q is extremely large. Because when Q is very large, it appears like there's no time uh, quantum. You just get the CPU until you complete. If Q is uh, very small, uh, then you will have so many context switches that the overhead of context switch will be uh, too high, so it wouldn't be worth the effort. It's it, Therefore, it's important to adjust this uh, size of the time quantum properly. So, let's have a look uh, at an example. We are assuming that the length of our time quantum is four milliseconds and we have three processes 
P1, P2, P3 all available again at t equals 0 with, a, uh, burst, uh, with their burst lengths of 24, 3, 3 as one of the previous examples. Now, if you draw the Gantt chart, since the uh, time quantum Q is 4, the first process P1 gets uh, to go to the CPU not for 24 milliseconds, but only for 4 milliseconds. Okay, Then it switches to P2 and gives P2 a time quantum of 4 milliseconds again. However, P2's uh, burst length is only 3. So although it's given the CPU for 4 milliseconds, it will complete in 3 milliseconds and we never let the CPU sit idle for 1 millisecond due to a process which has already ended. Therefore, we immediately do a context switch, this time to the next process, which is P3. So again, we give uh, the CPU to P3 for 4 milliseconds, but it uses only for 3 milliseconds. Then we return to P1 for 4 milliseconds. No one arrives, so P1 continues for another 4 milliseconds, for another, for another, until it completes. After uh, t 30, in this example, we don't have any more processes left. Therefore, uh, the CPU would sit idle, but of course, in real life, that would never happen. Uh, one thing to note here is, again, for the context switches, we're assuming in the example that it immediately happens, so we don't have any uh, dispatch latency. And one other thing is, it appears like P1 uh, is doing a context switch with itself over and over. Of course, in real life, in the operating systems, when the operating system realizes that uh, the current process and the next process that should go into the CPU are the same. Of course, it doesn't do an unnecessary context switch, but just for the sake of uh, understandability, uh, it's shown here as if there are uh, context switches. Typically, uh, higher uh, it, uh, round robin uh, scheduling will end up with higher average turnaround time compared to shortest job first. Remember that uh, average turnaround time, it's the uh, time that passes from the submission of the process to the system until its completion. Since you switch between different processes, that means you give the CPU to some other processes, there will be, on the average, a higher turnaround time. But the more important thing is uh, round-robin scheduling allows for better response time compared to shortest job first. Remember, shortest job first is the optimal solution for uh, the average turnaround time. But response time is the time the process is submitted to the system until the time you get the first response. Since round robin gives the chance, gives the CPU to all processes uh, in turn, uh, with their, according to their time quantums, each process gets to use the CPU in a short time. Remember, if you assume fixed time quantums, uh, each process gets a CPU in n minus one uh, times q time units. Therefore, uh, it has a better response time. Uh, we, we can say q should be large enough uh, compared to the uh, context switch time because the context switch time introduces and uh, overhead. And typically, as we said, the uh, time quantum length is between 10 to 100 milliseconds in most op uh, most uh, modern operating systems. And the context switch time is typically 10 microseconds. Okay, so uh, there is actually something like a factor of 1000 there, uh, approximately. So, just for the sake of the uh, example, assume that we have one process that has uh, an uh, execution time of 10 uh, milliseconds. And also assume that our quantum time quantum is of length 12. In this case, there will be no context switches necessary. 
if we have uh, a quantum length of 6, then after 6 milliseconds, uh, the process will be preempted and control will pass to some other process. It's not shown here. And then uh, when it's again time for the uh, for this process, it will again get a 6 milliseconds uh, time quantum. It will use 4 of it. Uh, so in total, it would have used 10. Note that in this figure here, Although there are other processes that go in here after the uh, 6 millisecond, this figure just ignores the rest and sh is just focusing on the time dedicated to this process. But note that there we would have a context switch to the other process. So there would be one context switch. Now, if we take the time quantum down to uh, 1 millisecond, and again, assuming that there are other you know, processes in the system, so there are context switches, but we are not showing it in the figure, we are just picking the uh, time quantums given to this process. Uh, this process would complete in 10 uh, time quantums, therefore we would need 9 context switches. So as you can see, as the time quantums uh, get smaller, the number of context switches uh, gets larger. That's why the uh, context switch uh, should be much smaller compared to the uh, uh, time quantum given to the uh, processes. One important thing to note here is uh, as the time quantums increase, uh, we said it should be large enough, uh, but depending on the scenario, here you're given a scenario, for example, a P1234. Uh, with execution times of uh, 6, 3, 1, and 7. For different time quantums, if you solve this uh, system, you see that the average turnaround time as time quantum increases gets worse. If it's increasing, uh, we'd like to remember uh, lower turnaround times. So as the time quantum increases, the average turnaround time first gets worse, then better, then terrible, then better, doesn't change. So in, in fact, what we can say is the turnaround times varies with the time quantum, but in a random fashion. Actually, if you just change the numbers here, the results will also change. So it is difficult to estimate how uh, the, if, uh, if, what the effect on average turnaround time would be by varying the time quantum. But what we can say is uh, for a proper uh, performance, uh, you should pick Q, the time quantum length, such that 80% of the CPU bursts are shorter than uh, the time quantum, which implies, in general, try to finish the CPU bursts as much as possible during the time quantum, but don't make the time quantum extremely large because in that case, as we said, this uh, round-robin uh, scheduling uh, converges to first-come, first-served, which, remember, also has its problems like convoy effect.